Welcome to the hands-on A-B testing crash course, where we will do some refreshment when it comes to A-B testing. If you are looking for that one course where you can learn and quickly refresh your memory for A-B testing and how to actually do an A-B testing case study hands-on in Python, then you are in the right place. In this crash course, we are going to refresh our memory for the A-B test design including the power analysis and defining those different parameters such as minimum detectable effect, statistical significance level, and also the uh, type 2 probability, so the power of the test. And then we are going to do hands-on case study project where we will be conducting an A-B testing results analysis in Python. At the end of this course, you can expect to know everything about designing an A-B test what it means as a, uh, to design a proper A-B test and how to do a A-B test results analysis in Python in a proper way. I'm Date Vaslian, co-founder at Lunatech, and I have been in data science for the last five years. I have learned A-B testing end-to-end -end after following numerous blogs and numerous research papers and courses. And I've noticed that there is not a one place, one course, that will cover all the fundamentals and necessary stuff, both the theory and implementation in Python in one place. And that's about to change, as we have this crash course that will help you to do exactly that, to learn how to design an A-B test in a proper way as a good and solid data scientist and to showcase your skills by doing Python A-B testing results analysis. So whether you are a product scientist, whether you are a data analyst, data scientist, or a product manager who wants to learn about A-B testing at high level and how it can be done in Python, then you are in the right place. Because in this crash course, we are going to refresh our memory what it means to properly design an A-B test, which means doing power analysis and also calculating the sample size by hand by following the statistical guidelines and ensuring that everything is done properly and then, as the second part of this crash course, we are also going to do a hands-on case study in Python when it comes to performing A-B testing results analysis. So we are going to cover all these important concepts such as p-values, sample size, and also uh, interpreting the A-B test results using standard error, calculating those uh, estimates, pooled variants, and then evaluating the A-B test results, including confidence interval, generalizability, of the results, reproducibility of the results. So without further ado, let's get started. A-B testing is an important topic for data scientists to know because it's a powerful method for evaluating changes or improvements to the products or services. It allows us to make data-driven decisions by comparing the performance of a two different versions of a product or a service, usually referred as treatment or control. For example, A-B testing allows data scientists to measure the effectiveness of changes to a product or a service, which is important as it enables data scientists to make data-driven decisions rather than relying on intuition or assumptions. Secondly, A-B testing helps data scientists to identify the most effective changes to a product or a service, which is really important because it allows us to optimize the performance of a product or a service, which can then lead to increased customer satisfaction and sales. A-B testing helps us also to validate certain hypotheses about what changes will improve a product or a service. This is important because it helps us to build a deeper understanding of the customers and the factors that influence customers' behavior. Finally, A-B testing is a common practice in many industries such as e-commerce, digital marketing, website optimization, and many others. So data scientists who have knowledge and experience in A-B testing will be more valuable to these companies. No matter in which industry you want to enter as a data scientist and what kind of job you will be interviewed for, and even if you believe more technical data science is your cup of tea, be prepared to know at least high-level understanding and the details behind this method. It will definitely help you to know about this topic when you are speaking with product owners, stakeholders, product scientists, and other people involved in the business. Let's briefly discuss a perfect audience for this section of the course and prerequisites. There are no prerequisites of this section in terms of A-B testing concepts that you should know already, but knowing the basics in statistics, which you can find in the Fundamentals to Statistics section, is highly recommended. 
This section will be great if you have no prior A-B testing knowledge and you want to identify and learn the essential A-B testing concepts from scratch. So this will help you to prepare for your job interviews. It will also be a good refresher for anyone who does have A-B testing knowledge but who wants to refresh their memory or want to fill in the gaps in their knowledge. In this lecture, we will start off the topic about A-B testing, where we will formally define what A-B testing is, and we will look at the high-level overview of A-B testing process step by step. By definition, A-B testing or split testing is originated from the statistical randomized control trials and is one of the most popular ways for businesses to test new UX features, new versions of a product, or an algorithm to decide whether your business should launch that new UX feature or should productionalize that new recommender system, create that new product, that new button, or that new algorithm. The idea behind A-B testing is that you should show the variated or the new version of the product to a sample of customers, often referred as experimental group, and the existing version of the product to another sample of customers, referred as control group. Then the difference in the product performance in experimental versus control group is tracked to identify the effect of these new versions of the product on the performance of the product. So the goal is then to track the metric during the test period and find out whether there is a difference in the performance of the product and what type of difference is it. The motivation behind this test is to test new product variants that will improve the performance of the existing product and will make this product more successful and optimal showing a positive treatment effect. What makes this testing great is that businesses are getting direct feedback from their actual users by presenting them the existing versus the variated product version, and in this way they can quickly test new ideas. In case of A-B test shows that the variated version is not effective, at least businesses can learn from this and can decide whether they need to improve it or need to look for other ideas. Let us go through the steps included in the A-B testing process, which will give you a higher level overview into the process. The first step in conducting A-B testing is stating the hypothesis of the A-B test. This is the process that includes coming up with business and statistical hypothesis that you would like to test with this test, including how you measure the success, which we will call primary metric. Next step in A-B testing is to perform what we call power analysis and design the entire test, which includes making assumptions about the most important parameters of the test and calculate the minimum sample size required to claim statistical significance. The third step in A-B testing is to run the actual A-B test, which in practical sense for the data scientist means making sure that the test runs smoothly and correctly, collaborate with engineers and product managers to ensure that all the requirements are satisfied. This also includes collecting the data of control and experimental groups, which will be used in the next step. Next step in A-B testing is choosing the right statistical test, whether it is Z-test, T-test, chi-square test, etc., to test the hypothesis from the step 1 by using the data collected from the previous step, and to determine whether there is a statistically significant difference between the control versus experimental group. The fifth and the final step in A-B testing is continuing to analyze the results and find out whether besides statistical significance, there is also practical significance. In this step, we use the second step's power analysis, so all the assumptions that we made about model parameters and the sample size, and the fourth step's results to determine whether there is a practical significance beside of the statistical significance. This summarizes the A-B testing process at a high level. In the next couple of lectures, we will go through the steps one at a time. So buckle up and let's learn about A-B testing. In this lecture, lecture number two, we will discuss the first step in A-B testing process. So let's bring our diagram back. As you can recall from the previous lecture, when we were discussing the entire process of A-B testing at a high level, we saw that in the first step in conducting A-B testing is stating the hypothesis of A-B tests. This process includes coming up with a business and statistical hypothesis that you would like to test with this test, including how you measure the success, which we call a primary metric. So what is the metric that we can use to say that the product that we are testing performs well? First, we need to state the business hypothesis for our A-B test from a business perspective. 
So formally, business hypothesis describes what the two products are that being compared and what is the desired impact or the difference for the businesses. So how to fix a potential issue in the product where a solution of these two problems will influence the, what we call a key performance indicator or the KPI of the interest. Business hypothesis is usually set as a result of brainstorming and collaboration of relevant people on the product team and data science team. The idea behind this hypothesis is to decide how to fix a potential issue in the product where a solution of these problems will improve the target KPI. One example of business hypothesis is that changing the color of learn more button, for instance, to green will increase the engagement of the web page. Next, we need to select what we call primary metric for our A-B testing. There should be only a one primary metric in your A-B test. Choosing this metric is one of the most important parts of A-B tests, since this metric will be used to measure the performance of the product or feature for the experimental and control groups, and then will be used to identify whether there is a difference or what we call statistically significant difference between these two groups. By definition, primary metric is a way to measure the performance of the product being tested in the A-B test for the experimental and control groups. It will be used to identify whether there is a statistically significant difference between these two groups. The choice of the success metric depends on the underlying hypothesis that is being tested with this A-B test. This is, if not the most, one of the most important parts of the A-B test because it determines how the test will be designed and also how well the proposed ideas perform. Choosing poor metrics might disqualify a large amount of work or might result in wrong conclusions. For instance, the revenue is not always the end goal. Therefore, in A-B testing, we need to tie up the primary metric to the direct and the higher level goals of the product. The expectation is that if the product makes more money, then this suggests the content is great. But in achieving that goal, instead of improving the overall content of the material and writing, one can just optimize the conversion funnels. One way to test the accuracy of the metric you have chosen as your primary metric for your A-B test could be to go back to the exact problem you want to solve. You can ask yourself the following question, what I tend to call the metric validity question. So if the chosen metric were to increase significantly, while well, everything else stays constant, would we achieve our goal and would we address our business problem? Is it higher revenue? Is it higher customer engagement or is it high views that we are chasing in the business? So the choice of the metric will then answer this question. Though you need to have a single primary metric for your A-B test, you still need to keep an eye on the remaining metrics to make sure that all the metrics are showing the change and not only the target one. Having multiple metrics in your A-B test will lead to false positives since you will identify many significant differences while there is no effect which is something you want to avoid. So it's always a good idea to pick just a single primary metric, but to keep an eye and monitor all the remaining metrics. So if the answer to the metric validity question is higher revenue, which means that you are saying that the higher revenue is what you are chasing and better performance means higher revenue for your product, then you can use as your primary metric what we call a conversion rate. Conversion rate is a metric that is used to measure the effectiveness of a website, a product, or a marketing campaign. It is typically used to determine the percentage of visitors or customers who take a desired action, such as making a purchase, filling out a form, or signing up for a service. The formula for conversion rate is conversion rate is equal to number of conversions divided to number of total visitors multiplied by 100%. For example, if a website has 1,000 visitors and 50 of them make a purchase, the conversion rate would be equal to 50 divided to 1,000 multiplied by 100%, which gives us 5%. This means that our conversion rate in this case is equal to 5%. Conversion rate is an important metric because it allows us and businesses to measure the effectiveness of their website, a product, or a marketing campaign. It can help businesses to identify areas for improvement, such as increasing the number of conversions or improving the user experience. Conversion rate can be used for different purposes. For example, if a company wants to measure the effectiveness of an online store, the conversion rate would be the percentage of visitors who make a purchase. And on the other hand, 
if a company wants to measure the effectiveness of landing page, the conversion rate would be the percentage of visitors who fill out the form or sign up for a service. So if the answer to the metric validity question is higher engagement, then you can use the click-through rate or CTR as your primary metric. This is, by the way, a common metric used in A-B testing whenever we are dealing with e-commerce product, search engine, recommender system. Click-through rate or the CTR is a metric that measures the effectiveness of a digital marketing campaign or the user engagement or some feature on your web page or your website, and it's typically used to determine the percentage of users who click on a specific link or a button or call to action CTA out of the total number of users who view it. The formula for the click-through rate can be represented as follows. So the CTR is equal to number of clicks divided to number of impressions multiplied by 100%. Not to be confused with click-through probability, because there is a difference between the click-through rate and click-through probability. For example, if an online advertisement receives thousands of impressions, which means that we are showing it to the customers for a thousand times, and there were 25 clicks, which means 25 out of all these impressions resulted in clicks, this means that the click-through rate for this specific example would be equal to 25 divided to 1000 multiplied by 100%, which gives us 2.5%. This means that for this particular example, our click-through rate is equal to 2.5%. Click-through rate is an important metric because it allows businesses to measure the effectiveness of their digital marketing campaigns and their user engagement with their website or web pages. High click-through rate indicates that a campaign or the web page or a feature is relevant and appealing to the target audience because they are clicking on it, while low click-through rate indicates that a campaign or the web page needs an improvement. Click-through rate can be used to measure the performance of different digital marketing channels, such as paid search, display advertising, email marketing, and social media. It can also be used to measure the performance of different ad formats, such as text advertisements, banner advertisement, video advertisements, etc. Next, and the final task in this first step in the process of A-B testing is to state the statistical hypothesis based on the business hypothesis and the chosen primary metric. Next, and in the final task in this first step of the A-B testing process, we need to state the statistical hypothesis based on the business hypothesis we stated and the chosen primary metric. In the section of fundamentals to statistics of this course, in lecture number seven, we went into details about statistical hypothesis testing, included what null hypothesis is and what alternative hypothesis is. So do have a look to get all the insights about this topic. A-B testing should always be based on a hypothesis that needs to be tested. This hypothesis is usually set as a result of brainstorming and collaboration of relevant people on the product team and data science team. The idea behind this hypothesis is to decide how to fix a potential issue in a product where a solution of these problems will influence the key performance indicators or the KPI of interest. It's also highly important to make prioritization out of a range of product problems and ideas to test, while you want to pitch that fixing this problem would result in the biggest impact for the product. We can put the hypothesis that is subject to rejection so that we want to reject in the ideal world under the null hypothesis, what we define by H0. While we can put the hypothesis subject to acceptance, so the desired hypothesis that we would like to have, as a result of A-B testing under the alternative hypothesis defined by H1. For example, if the KPI of the product is to increase the customer engagement by changing the color of the read more button from blue to green, then under the null hypothesis, we can state that click-through rate of learn more button with blue color is equal to the click-through rate of green button. Under the alternative, we can then state that the click-through rate of the learn more button with green color is larger than the click-through of the blue button. So ideally, we want to reject this null hypothesis and we want to accept the alternative hypothesis, which will mean that we can improve the click-through rate, so the engagement of our product, by simply changing the color of the button from blue to green. Once we have set up the business hypothesis, selected the primary metrics, and stated the statistical hypothesis, we are ready to proceed to the next stage in the A-B testing process. 
In this lecture, we will discuss the next second step in A-B testing process, which is designing the A-B tests, including the power analysis and calculating the minimum sample sizes for the control and experimental groups. Stay tuned as this is a very important part of A-B testing process commonly appearing during the data science interviews. Some argue that A-B testing is an art, and others say that it's a business-adjusted common statistical test. But the borderline is that to properly design this experiment, you need to be disciplined and intentional while keeping in mind that it's not really about testing, but it's about learning. Following are the steps you need to take to have a solid design for your A-B test. So let's bring the diagram back. So in this step, we need to perform the power analysis for our A-B test and calculate the minimum sample size in order to design our A-B test. A-B test design includes three steps. The first step is power analysis, which includes making assumptions about the model parameters, including the power of the test, the significance level, etc. The second step is to use these parameters from power analysis to calculate the minimum sample size for the control and experimental groups. And then the final third step is to decide on the test duration depending on several factors. So let's discuss each of these topics one by one. Power analysis for A-B testing includes these three specific steps. The first one is determining the power of the test. This is our first parameter. The power of the statistical test is the probability of correctly rejecting the null hypothesis. Power is the probability of making a correct decision, so to reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. If you're wondering what is the power of the test, what is these different concepts that we just talked about, what is this null hypothesis and what does it mean to reject the null hypothesis, then head towards the fundamentals to the statistics section of this course as we discuss this topic in detail as part of that section. The power is often defined by 1 minus beta, which is equal to the probability of not making a type 2 error, where type 2 error is the probability of not rejecting the null hypothesis, while the null is actually false. It's common practice to pick 80% as the power of the A-B test, which means that we allow 20% of type 2 error, and this means that we are fine with not detecting, so failing to reject the null hypothesis 20% of the time, which means that we are fine with not detecting a true treatment effect while there is an effect, which means that we are failing to reject the null. However, the choice of a value of this parameter depends on the nature of the test and the business constraints. Secondly, we need to determine a significance level for our A-B test. The significance level, which is also the probability of type 1 error, is the likelihood of rejecting the null, hence detecting a treatment effect while the null is actually true and there is no statistically significant impact. This value, often defined by a Greek letter alpha, is the probability of making a false discovery, often referred to as a false positive rate. Generally, we use the significance level of 5%, which indicates that we have 5% risk of concluding that there exists a statistically significant difference between the experimental and control variant performances when there is no actual difference. So we are fine by having 5 out of 100 cases detecting a treatment effect while there is no effect. It also means that you have a significant result difference between the control and the experimental groups within 95% confidence. Like in the case of the power of the test, the choice of the alpha is dependent on the nature of the test and the business constraints that you have. For instance, if running this A-B test is related to high engineering costs, then the business might decide to pick a high alpha, such that it would be easier to detect the treatment effect. On the other hand, if the implementation costs of the proposed version in production are high, you can then pick a lower significance level since this proposed feature should really have a big impact to justify the high implementation costs, so it should be harder to reject the null hypothesis. Finally, as the last type of power analysis, we need to determine a minimum detectable effect for the test. The last parameter as part of the power analysis we need to make assumptions about is what we call minimum detectable effect or delta. From the business point of view, so what is the substantive to the statistical significance that the business wants to see as a minimum impact of the new version to find this variant investment worthy? The answer to this question is, what is the amount of change we aim to observe in a new version's metric compared to the existing one to make recommendations to the business that this feature should be launched in the production, that it's investment worthy? An estimate of this parameter is what is known as a minimum detectable effect, 
often defined by a Greek letter delta, which is also related to the practical significance of the test. So this MDE, or the minimum detectable effect, is a proxy that relates to the smallest effect that would matter in practice for the business, and it's usually set by stakeholders. As this parameter is highly dependent on the business, there is no common level of it. Instead, so this minimum detectable effect is basically the translation from statistical significance to the practical significance. And here we want to see and we want to answer the question, what is this percentage increase in the performance of the product that we want to experiment with? That will tell to the business that this is good enough to invest in this new feature or in this new product. And this can be, for instance, 1% for one product, it can be 5% for another one. And it really depends on the business and what is the underlying KPI. A popular reference to the parameters involved in the power analysis for A-B testing is like this. So 1 minus beta for the power of the test, alpha for the significance level, delta for the minimum detectable effect. To make sure that our results are repeatable, robust, and can be generalized to the entire population, we need to avoid p-hacking, to ensure real statistical significance, and to avoid biased results. So we want to make sure that we collect enough amount of observations and we run the test for a minimum predetermined amount of time. Therefore, before running the test, we need to determine the sample size of the control and experimental groups, as well as later on in this lecture we will see also how long we need to run the test. So this is another important part of A-B testing, which needs to be done using the defined power of the test, which was the 1 minus beta, the significance level, and a minimum detectable effect. So all the parameters that we decided upon when conducting the power analysis. Calculation of the sample size depends on the underlying primary metric as well that you have chosen for tracking the progress of the control and experimental versions of the product. So we need to distinguish here two cases. So when discussing the primary metric, we saw that there are different ways that we can measure the performance of different type of products. If we are interested in engagement, then we are looking at a metric such as click-through rate, which is in the form of averages. So the case one will be where the primary metric of A-B testing is in the form of a binary variable. It can be, for instance, conversion or no conversion, click or no click, and in case two, where the primary metric of the test is in the form of proportions or averages, which means mean order amount or mean click-through rate, for today, we will be covering only one of these cases, but you can find more details on the second case in my blog, which I posted also as part of the resources section. This blog post contains all the details that you need to know about A-B testing, including the statistical tests and their corresponding hypothesis, the descriptions of different primary metrics that go beyond what we have covered as part of this section, as well as many more details that you need to know about A-B testing. So let's look at a case two where the primary metric of the test is in the form of proportions or averages. So let's say we want to test whether the average click-through rate of control is equal to the average click-through rate of experimental group. And under H0, we have that the mu control is equal to mu experimental. And under H1, we have that the mu control is not to mu experimental. So here, the mu control and mu experimental are simply the average of the primary metric for control group and for the experimental group respectively. So this is the formal hypothesis we want to test with our A-B test. And we can assume that this mu control is, for instance, the click-through rate of the control group, and the mu experimental is the click-through rate of the experimental group. So this is the formal statistical hypothesis we want to test with our A-B test. If you haven't done so, I would highly suggest you to head towards the fundamental statistics section of this course, where in lecture number 7 and 8 of the statistical part of this course, I go in detail about statistical hypothesis testing, the means, averages, significance level, etc. This also holds for the theorem that the sample size calculation is based upon, called central limit theorem. So check out the last lecture about inferential statistics where I cover the central limit theorem, which we will also use in this section. And finally, also check the lecture number five in that section where we cover the normal distribution, another thing that we will use as part of this section. So the central limit theorem states that given a sufficiently large sample size from an arbitrary distribution, the sample mean will be approximately normally distributed, regardless of the shape of the original population distribution. This means that the distribution of the sample means will be approximately normal if we take a large enough sample, even if the distribution of the original sample is not normal. 
So when we are dealing with a primary performance tracking metric that is in the form of average, such as this one that we are covering today, which is a click-through rate, we intend to compare the means of the control and experimental groups. Then we can use the central limit theorem as state that the mean sampling distribution of both control and experimental groups follow normal distribution. Consequently, the sampling distribution of the difference of the means of these two groups also will be normally distributed. So this can be expressed like this, where we see that the mean of the control group and mean of the experimental group follows normal distribution with mean mu control and mu experimental respectively, and then with the variance of sigma control squared and sigma experimental squared respectively. Though derivation of this proof is out of the scope of this course, we can state that the difference between the means of the true group, so x bar control minus x bar experimental, also follows normal distribution, with the mean mu control minus mu experimental, and with the variance of sigma control squared divided to n control, plus sigma experimental squared divided to n experimental, so the sample size of the experimental group and the sample size of the control group. Hence, the sample size needed to compare the means of the two normally distributed samples using a two-sided test with pre-specified significance level alpha, power level, and minimum detectable effect can be calculated as follows. So here you can see the mathematical representation of the minimum sample size. So the n, which stands for the minimum sample size, is equal to, and in the denominator we have sigma control squared plus sigma experimental squared multiplied by z1 minus alpha divided to 2 plus z1 minus beta squared divided to the delta squared. And here, the alpha and the beta and the delta, we have made assumptions about as part of the power analysis. And the sigma control squared and the sigma experimental squared are the uh, estimates of the variance that we can come up with using the so-called AA testing. I would say you do not necessarily need to know this derivation, as there are many online calculators that will ask you for the alpha, the beta, and the delta values, as well as the sample estimates for the sigma squared control and experimental, and then these calculators will automatically calculate the minimum sample size for you. If you are wondering what this AA testing is, and how we can come up with the sigma control squared and sigma experimental squared, as well as all the other values, then make sure to to check out the blog that I posted before and that I mentioned before as I explain in detail all these values, as well as check out the resource section where I've included many resources regarding this. But for now, just keep in mind that the z1 minus alpha divided to 2 and z1 minus beta are just two constants and come from the normal distributed and standard normal distributed tables. I would say you do not necessarily need to know this derivation, as there are many online calculators that will ask you for this alpha, beta, and delta values, as well as the sample estimates for the sigma squared control and sigma experimental control, and then will calculate automatically the sample size for you for the control and experimental group effectively. One example of such calculator is this A-B testing online calculator, but if you Google it, you will find many others that will ask you for the minimum detectable effect, for the statistical significance or the statistical power, and then it will automatically calculate for you the minimum sample size that you should have in order to have a statistical significance and in order to have a valid A-B test. One thing to keep in mind is that you will notice that the statistical significance level is set to 95% in here which is not what we have seen when we were discussing the alpha or significance level. So sometimes these online calculators will confuse or will interchangeably use the significance level versus the confidence level, which are the opposite. So the significance level is usually at the level of 5% or 1%. Confidence level is around 95%, so which is basically 100% minus the alpha. Therefore, whenever you see this 95%, know that this means that your alpha should be 5%. So it's really important to understand how to use this calculator, not to end up with the wrong minimum sample size, conduct an entire A-B test, and then at the end realize that you have used the wrong uh, significance level. The final step is to calculate the test duration. This question needs to be answered before you run your experiment and not during the experiment. Sometimes people stop the test when they detect statistical significance, which is what we call p-hacking, and that's absolutely not what you want to do. To, de to determine the baseline of a duration time, a common approach is to use this formula. As you can see, duration is equal to n divided to the number of visitors per day, where n is your minimum sample size that we just calculated in the previous step. And the number of visitors per day is the average number of visitors that you expect to see as part of your experiment. 
For instance, if this formula results in 14 days or 14, this suggests that running the test for two weeks is a good idea. However, it is highly important to take many business-specific aspects into account when choosing the time to run the test and for how long you need to run it, and simply using this formula is not enough. For example, if you want to run an experiment at the end of the month December with Christmas breaks, when higher than expected or lower than expected number of people are usually checking your web page, then this external and uncertain event had an impact on the page usage. For some businesses, this means... Uh -huh. For example, if you want to run an experiment at the end of the month of December with Christmas breaks, when higher than expected or in some cases lower than expected number of people are usually checking the web page, so depending on the nature of your business or the product, then this external and uncertain event can have an impact on the page usage for some businesses, which means that for some businesses, a high increase in the page usage can be the result, and for some, a huge decrease in usability. In this case, running A-B tests without taking into account this external factor would result in inaccurate results, since the activity period would not be a true representation of a common page usage, and we no longer have this randomness which is a crucial part of A-B testing. Besides this, when selecting a specific test duration, there are a few other things to be aware of. Firstly, too small test duration might result in what we call novelty effects. Users tend to react quickly and positively to all types of changes independent of their nature. So it's referred as a novelty effect and it varies off in time and is just considered illusionary. So it would be wrong to describe this effect to the experimental version itself and to expect that it will continue to persist after the novelty effect wears off. Hence, when picking a test duration, we need to make sure that we do not run the test for a too short amount of time period, otherwise we can have a novelty effect. Novelty effect can be a major threat to the external validity of an A-B test, so it's important to avoid it as much as possible. Secondly, if the test duration is too large, then we can have what we call maturation effects. When planning an A-B test, it's usually useful to consider a longer test duration for allowing users to get used to a new feature or product. In this way, one will be able to observe the real treatment effect by giving more time to returning users to cool down from an initial positive reaction or a spike of interest due to a change that was introduced as part of a treatment. This should help to avoid novelty effect and is better predictive value for the test outcome. However, the longer the test period, the larger is the likelihood of external effect impacting the reaction of the users and possibly contaminating the test results. This is what we call maturation effect. And therefore, running the AP test for too short amount of time or too long amount of time is not recommended. As this is a very involved topic, we can talk for hours about this part of the AB test. And also a topic that is asked a lot during the data science and product scientist interviews. Therefore, I highly suggest you to check out this blog about AB testing, which is a hands-on tutorial about everything you need to know about AB testing, as well as check out the interview preparation guide in this section that contains 30 most popular AB testing related questions you can expect during your data science interviews. So stay tuned, and in the next couple of lectures, we will cover the next stages of A-B testing process. If you are looking for one place to learn everything about A-B testing without unnecessary difficulties, but also with a good statistical and data science background, then ensure and make sure to check out the A-B testing course at lunatech.ai. So if you want to learn all this background information, including what is statistical significance, what is A-B testing, how can A-B testing be done, and you want to have this end-to-end A-B testing course, then make sure to check the A-B testing for data science course at lawyertech.ai. That's the only course that is available at the moment on the internet that covers the most fundamental concepts of A-B testing, including the theory and the implementation in Python without no the extra details and right going straight to the point in order to help you to kickstart your journey with A-B testing. The resource that I would suggest you to keep by the hand is the blog called Complete Guide to A-B Testing, Design, Implementation and Pitfalls, which is part of the hands-on tutorials of the Towards Data Science.
So in here, and specifically this part where we are discussing the two sample Z test, I would suggest you to go through it as we are going to conduct this uh, two sample Z test as part of our Python. And we are going to learn how to implement this in Python. In this book, you can learn everything out there that you need to know about A-B testing, including different uh, pitfalls include of A-B testing, the process behind it, how you can conduct the A-B test uh, end-to-end, how you can calculate the sample size, how you can choose a test, the primary metric definitions, different uh, statistical tests that you can use, including the chi-square test, the two-sample Z test, and two-sample T test. So given that as part of the lectures of the um, A-B testing and specifically lecture number five, we have already discussed the two-sample T-test and how to implement it. I thought it would be more useful for you to know how to implement the two-sample Z-test, such that you know both of them and you know their theory behind it and also how to implement them. And finally, if you are wondering how you can implement them in Python, then head towards my uh, blog uh, in the Medium as well as my GitHub repository that I will post in the resource section where you can find all the different statistical tests you can use for analyzing your A-B test results, including the two-sample t-test, two-sample z-test, chi-square test, and much more. So without further ado, let's get started with our demo. So uh, as you can see here, I'm generating the data myself, assuming that uh, the uh, primary metric follows binomial distribution. So the output is in the form of a zeros and ones because we are looking into the click event and click can be either zero or one. And then I'm using here the uh, binomial distribution to randomly sample from it. And in case of the experimental version, I'm using a probability of success equal to 0 0.4. And in case of the control version, I'm using a probability of success equal to 0 0.2 because I want to have a quite difference between the two groups. And then later on, we can also adjust this and we can change the uh, difference to see how our test behaves. So um, I'll assume that um, the, uh, at the end of the uh, data generation process, we have a data that is similar to the form that you will get from the uh, engineers once they uh, finish up uh, collecting all the data from your customers. And I will also assume that the integrity of the A-B test is held, which means that the observations who were in the control group, they only saw the control version of the product, and observations who were in the experimental group, they only saw the experimental version of the product. And let's actually go ahead and see how the data looks like. So as you can see here, we are generating our data. So the data is in this format. So you can see that we have an observation. In total, we have 20K observations because we have two different groups, each with 10K observations. And then the first column describes the click event. So we will either have a click or we will have no click. And the primary metric is in the form of a click. So we are measuring the performance of the product, both control and the experimental, with the same metric, which is whether there is a click event or no click event. And the primary metric is in the form of a binary variable. So we have either zeros or we have ones. Whenever there is a click, then the corresponding value is one. Whenever there is no click, then the corresponding value is zero. And then we have the corresponding group, which helps us to understand whether the observation belongs to the experimental group, so X, or the control group, which is um, uh, CON. So uh, this is how the data looks like. And this is also what you can uh, expect uh, from uh, data engineers uh, once the uh, A-B test is conducted. So you have run your A-B test and engineers have collected the data, assuming that the data integrity has been kept and also uh, that there was no systematic error when collecting and measuring the performance of the uh, control and the experimental versions of the product. First thing that we are going to do is to estimate the uh, p hat control and a p hat experimental. And for that, what we need to do first is to count the number of clicks per group. So we saw earlier that we have this data that we generate ourselves consisting of 20 k rows, where 10 belongs to the uh, control group and the 10k belongs to the experimental group. And each consists of this click variable and the group. The click variable is an indicator uh, that says that the observation clicked on the uh, page versus uh, not clicked on the page. So whenever there was a click, we have here one. Whenever there was no click, we have here zero. And then we have the corresponding uh, group such that we can use to group this data based on the control versus experimental group. And that's exactly what we are going to do as the first step in our process. So we are going to calculate the number of total clicks for control group and for the experimental group. So here we are making use of the function group by in order to group this data frame. So this data frame based on a group 
and then we want to click uh, the we want to get the uh, click variable and we want to sum this variable because the uh, variable is of a binary nature so we have ones and zeros if we do the sum we are basically counting the number of times we have the uh, observation a uh, click equal to one so by summing a binary variable, we are simply getting the number of ones in that variable. And that's exactly what we are doing in this part. And then what is remaining is to get the uh, number of clicks from control group and number of clicks from the experimental group by using this function called look. So we saw earlier when we were discussing the um, accessing of observations in a pandas data frame that there is a difference between ILOC and LOC. And the reason why we are using here the log is because the uh, group uh, data that we are getting in here, it will provide us an output where the index is in the uh, format of a string. So let's actually go ahead and uh, print that part because I think it's an important part to see how the data looks like. And it also will make sense why I'm using here the log function to access the uh, control group's number of clicks and the experimental group's number of clicks. So this is the uh, group data frame that we are getting. As you can see, we are getting here the group. And here we are getting for the control uh, index, the number of clicks is equal to 1,924. And for the experimental group, it's equal to 5,070. So then the next thing what we need to do is actually access this value. And for that, we need to specify that we want to access the value corresponding to the index equal to control. And this can be done by using this log function. So you cannot use ilog or any other way of accessing this because the index is of string type. And therefore, we are using the log. So let's actually also add some print statements to make our code more readable. So this will then print the number of clicks per control group and per experimental group. Here we go. So as you can see, we are nicely accessing the correct values. Then the next step is to calculate the p hat control and the p hat experimental. So basically the estimates of the click probabilities of the control group and the experimental group respectively. And for that we just need to take the uh, number of clicks and we need to divide it to the number of observations for that group. So it is this part. Let's go ahead and calculate those values. So as you can see, I'm taking the number of clicks that we just obtained and I'm dividing it to the number of observations that we have defined in the very beginning. Here we go. So as you can see, for the control group, the uh, click probability is equal to 0 0.20. And in case of the experimental group, it's equal to 0 0.5. So we see that uh, there is a large difference between the click probability for these two groups, which is um, a reflection of what we saw here, because we generated the data such that the uh, success probability for the experimental group is equal to 0 0.5, and the um, for the control group is equal to 0 0.2. So we see these numbers reflecting also in here. And the reason for that is because we have sampled our data large enough, and we see that the um, uh, probability, so the the mean of our sample, um, converges in uh, probability to the mean that we use. And this is also the idea behind the law of large numbers, something that we have also discussed as part of the fundamentals to statistics section of this course. So the next thing what we need to do is to compute the p pooled hat or the uh, estimate of the pooled uh, success probability. And we saw uh, when we were discussing the theory behind it that it's equal to the sum of the uh, clicks for both control and experimental group divided to the total number of observations in both control and the experimental group. So basically, the p pooled head is equal to x underscore control plus x underscore experimental divided to the n underscore control plus n underscore experimental. Then the next thing we need to do is to compute the pooled variance. And we just saw that the pooled variance can be calculated by taking the pooled uh, 
estimate for the click probability, so this p uh, pooled, and then multiplied by 1 minus p pooled head, and then multiplied by the inverses of the uh, observa number of observations in each of the groups, and there is some. So 1 divided to n control plus 1 divided to n experimental. So it can be calculated as follows. So pooled variance then is equal to your p pooled head multiplied by 1 minus p pooled head multiplied by 1 divided to n control plus 1 divided to n experimental. Let's also add some print statements. Here we go. And then the next step is to calculate the standard error. So the standard error is the square root of the pooled variance. So quite straightforward. And here we are going to make use of the numpy function. So the SE is equal to numpy dot. And a square root is simply uh, calculated by using the function SQRT, which stands for square root. And then here we need to mention the pooled variance. Let's also add the print statement explaining the, uh, the code. And this really can help your reviewer, the code reviewer, to understand what you are doing. Okay, so now we have also the standard error. And now we are ready to calculate our test statistics. So we saw that the test statistics is equal to the uh, p control head minus p experimental head divided to the standard error. And that's exactly what we are going to implement in here. So as you can see, the test statistics is equal to p control head minus p experimental head divided to the SC, so the standard error. And then finally, what we need to do is to compute the z critical value, the p value, and the confidence interval. But for doing that, we need to assume the significance level. So usually this is done before conducting the test, but here I'm assuming that before conducting the test, there was a power analysis. And as part of that, we have decided that the statistical significance level is equal to 5%. So let's add that here. So alpha is equal to 0 0.05. Therefore, we are going to use this specific alpha, so 5%, in order to calculate our critical value coming from the normal table. And to do this, there are uh, various options. So one way of doing that is to hard code the volume, which I would not recommend, but it is definitely uh, an easy way to go if you um, haven't used uh, the Python libraries uh, to automize this process. But here I will provide you the code and I will also tell you how you can use the uh, SciPy's norm um, function in order to calculate a critical volume. And I think keeping the code as general as possible will help you in the long term too, because it can be that this time you are calculating the critical value corresponding to alpha is equal to 0 0.05, but maybe next time you want to calculate the uh, critical value when your alpha is equal to 1%. So you are interested in the uh, case when your type 1 probability is equal to 1%. So for those cases, uh, you want to keep your code as general as possible, such that by changing your uh, variable, let's say alpha, you don't need to go each time and then in the chat GPT look for the uh, corresponding uh, value coming from the standard normal table. So for this, what we are going to use is the norm function. So the norm function come from the SciPy stats library. For that, we need to import from SciPy.stats the norm function, which stands for the normal distribution. So in here, what we need to use is the function called PPF, which is the uh, percentage point function. So the norm done PPF function stands for the percent point function, and it's usually known as the inverse cumulative distribution function or the CDF of the standard normal distribution. And it takes as an input the probability volume and it returns the corresponding value on the x-axis of the CDF. Uh, once you provide a p, so here we are providing the p, which is equal to 1 minus alpha divided to 2, then uh, this function calculates the x, so the x-axis, such that the probability of observing a value less than or equal to 2 or 2x in a standard normal distribution is equal to p. So we have this uh, inverse CDF, and we have the x-axis and we have the y-axis. On the y-axis, we have the probabilities, and on the x-axis, we have the x values. So here, what we are basically doing is that we are providing the probability that we have, which is equal to 1 minus alpha divided to 2, and we want to know the corresponding x volume. Therefore, it's also called inverse cumulative distribution function. And in this way, we can calculate that critical value, which can help us to identify the place where we need to have our rejection region. 
And uh, so here is the uh, rejection region of this test. And as you can see, we have a two-sided test. Therefore, we have also uh, two regions. And whenever the um, test statistics is larger than the critical value in the right-hand side, and it is smaller than the critical value from the left-hand side, then we are saying that uh, we can reject the null hypothesis. Therefore, it's also called the uh, rejection region. So uh, once we calculate the set critical volume, we are ready to go to the next step. But before that, let's also add some statement, print statement for readability in here. So the next step is to calculate a p-volume. And a p-volume can be calculated by using the norm.sf function. So the norm function comes once again from the scipy-stats library, and the sf stands for survival function. The norm.sf function stands for a survival function, and it stands for the complement of the CDF function, so the cumulative distribution function of the standard normal distribution. It calculates the probability of observing a value greater than a given threshold. So in this case, we want to calculate the uh, probability that our test statistics will be smaller than equal to the critical volume. And as we saw that the standard normal uh, distribution was symmetric, here we are multiplying just one side of that probability by two in order to obtain our final volume. So here, once we run this test, we will finally get our p-volume. And as you can see here, the p-value of the two sample z tests that we got is equal to zero. Well, now once we have the p-value and also we know what is our alpha, we are ready to test for the statistical significance of our results. So given that our p-value is equal to zero and it's smaller than 0 0.05, so our alpha, we can state that the null hypothesis can be rejected and we can state that there is a statistically significant difference between our experimental version of the product and the control version of the product. So this will help us to uh, test for the statistical significance of our A-B test. However, if you were, for instance, to have a different sample, so let's say we would compute, uh, we would randomly sample uh, from the binomial distribution. So as you can see, once we are getting the uh, probability of the success the same for the two groups, then the p-value becomes large, at least much larger than the alpha, which means that we can no longer reject the null hypothesis and we can no longer state that there is a statistical evidence at the 5% statistical level that the control version is statistically significantly different from the experimental version. And this uh, verifies that everything that we have done here is correct. So the A-B test results analysis is accurate. Now the question is whether we um, also have a practical significance uh, once we pass the statistical significance test. So let's move this back to what we had before. So this is 0 0.5. And once again, the p-value is just 0. And let's go ahead and calculate our confidence interval such that we can test for the practical significance and we can comment on the accuracy of the test and the generalizability of our A-B test. So we saw that the confidence interval can be calculated as follows. So we have the difference between the P hat experimental and the P hat control. And then for the lower bound, we need to uh, subtract from this the standard error multiplied by Z critical value. And then for the upper bound, we need to do the same only with summing the standard error multiplied by Z critical volume. So the difference here, you might notice, is this round function. And the reason why I'm adding this is because I want to have nice numbers that will be rounded, uh, just three numbers after the decimal, instead of having the long uh, floating numbers. So once we go ahead and print this confidence interval, we can also see the lower bound and the upper bound in numbers. Here we go. So as you can see, we are getting a confidence interval, which is quite narrow. So this is a suggestion that our A-B test results are most likely accurate and that the precision of our A-B test is high. And this is a good sign because then we can say that the A-B test we have conducted in here is most likely generalizable to the entire population. Then the next question is, okay, do we have a practical significance or not? And for that, we do need the final assumption regarding the minimum detectable effect. So let's say during the power analysis before conducting our A-B test, we got an MDE, which, or let's actually call it delta. Let's keep the Greek letters. Uh, and the delta, let's say, is equal to uh, 3%, so 0 0.03. Well, in this case, we can notice that the delta 0 0.03, so 3%, 
is much lower than the lower bound of our confidence interval, which is equal to 30%, so 29.7%. This means that in that case, we would have said that there is a practical significance also. But if the uh, delta would have been, for instance, the uh, 0.31, so we have a 31% delta, then in that case, the uh, delta is no longer smaller than the lower bound of our confidence interval. And in that case, we cannot say that our results are also practically significant. So depending on the business and depending on the assumption regarding the delta or the minimum detectable effect, we can then uh, compare this to the lower bound of the confidence interval, and we can state whether there is a practical significance or not. In case there is a practical significance, then we are good to go. So we can say that we have a statistical significance, we have a practical significance, and we also have a narrow confidence interval, which is a suggestion that our uh, results are also generalizable and accurate. So uh, this completes our uh, A-B test results analysis. And this is all that you need to do in order to have a valid and uh, good quality A-B test. Thank you for watching.